Hello Belding Hill Farms peeps. Today's video is about easy ways to raise baby chicks. And we're going to talk about brooder design, protection to keep them safe, their bedding, the heat lamps, waters, Feed. And, and observations of what Feed. to look for. And that's what you got coming up. Hi all, Luke here. And Jill. And we're Belding Hill Farms. Uh, if you're not familiar with our channel, Go ahead and hit uh, subscribe and like our videos to uh, see some more of our content upcoming. And please leave comments. We love to read them. Yeah, and we try to answer them all. Uh, if you have questions about raising baby chicks, we're happy to answer them. We promise you we're going to tell you easy ways to raise baby chicks. So here we go. All right, so to begin with, we're going to talk about uh, when you're raising baby chicks. And in our area, if you want to raise heritage birds, you pretty much have to raise baby chicks. Um, there really isn't uh, another option there for um, finding them. Um, you might also find sexed um, hen chicks at your local feed stores um, where you might raise those as well. But it's an important skill to learn on a homestead. So we'll start, I guess, with... The brooder, where they're going to live. Yeah, so the brooder essentially is just a, it's a place where they can be safe from the time that they're zero to nine weeks old. That's kind of the window of time we're talking about for raising chicks. Um, so brooder design in the technical aspects, although we're trying to break this video down today into the more basics. Um, but technically they say you need about a, about a half a square foot uh, per bird for a brooder up to four weeks old. Um, and then a one square foot in a brooder per bird after four weeks, four to nine weeks. So if you think about a four by eight sheet of plywood, that's four feet by eight feet, that's 32 square feet. So if you build a brooder that was that size at a one sheet of plywood, um, you could basically hold 32 birds up to nine weeks old. Yep. Right? And that follows with what we try to do here. Um, we see a lot of people who use uh, little Rubbermaid containers and stuff, and that's, that's good because um, it is clean. Yep. And we started out with that too. Yeah, we did too. Um, the only thing that we get concerned about there, and we'll come to that later when we're talking about the light, but sometimes it can be too enclosed and the chicks have a hard time escaping the heat. Um, so really there's no right or wrong when it comes to brooder design. You can make a fancy one out of plywood or you can use, people use a... Uh, dog fridge, crates. Dog crates, fridge boxes, like the cardboard box a fridge comes in. Um, you know the Rubbermaid containers there's no right or wrong you know what the numbers I just told you 0.5 square feet for 0 to 4 weeks 1 square feet um, from 4 weeks to 9 weeks and that will give you a rough idea and many of the, our customers are usually the backyard people who want 4 to 6 birds maybe 8 birds and you know one of them Rubbermaid containers would do for the first few weeks yep. so the next thing on uh, on the brooders is protecting them from cats yeah house cats could be a really bad thing yeah, yeah. ours you, has tried that <laughs> yeah your favorite little house cat that uh, sleeps on your lap uh, left alone with a, uh, a rubbermaid container full of chicks would happily eat some yeah. um, so really you have to have a cover but you have to think about that when you put a cover on it you can't put a solid cover on it because now you're really trapping heat inside of that box and uh, the chicks have to have the ability they have to have the ability to get heat but they also have to be able to escape heat so if you put something on maybe get a piece of hardware uh, cloth yep. you know the that works know, really well that works good because then it's ventilated and, and even sometimes if you're going to use the rubbermaid totes for a brooder we recommend that you drill some holes in it so it has some air flow yep. through it instead of just being one captive box. And try and put your light towards one end. Yeah. So that they can go down there for heat and then they can escape at the other end too. Yeah, exactly. So, um, well, since Jill started talking about the lights, let's just talk about that. So we use uh, heat lamps. Um, we just have this style of, of heat lamp and you can buy the special sockets for them or, or uh, whatever, but this is essentially the heat lamp that we use, that style, red light, and um, these ones are uh, 175 watts. Um, and really, what we tell, I, I, we've read all kinds of charts, and again, we started, uh, just like everyone, we started out with uh, not knowing a whole lot about this stuff, and then we've just learned over the years, 
get a copy of this if you don't have one. This is uh, Chicken Encyclopedia by Gail Damerow. Um, we use that a lot and we still use it after yeah. six years of raising yeah, a lot of birds. Time. We still refer to it. Um, so yeah, your heat lamp, there's all kinds of technical ways, but what we tell people is put your hand at the height of the chicken's head, wherever that is, and feel on the back of your hand what the temperature is. And what we want that temperature to be is warm for a human. Um, so like, you know, quite warm, but not so much that your hand is uncomfortable staying there. And if you have that directly underneath the light, then that's a pretty good starting spot for where you set your light. Yeah, unless you have a draft of some sort blowing in, and then you have to adjust it accordingly again. But yeah. it's still pretty much the same rule of thumb. And again, almost all of this, and no one really says this on any of the technical stuff, but it's common sense. Use your... You know, just use common sense. You shouldn't have a draft blowing on baby chickens. That just is common sense. But the beauty of using your hand is that as the chickens grow in height, then your hand is always coming up as well. So if your light was hanging over at um, one place and then your chickens are growing, well, obviously they're getting closer to the bulb. So if, if you always use your hand as a judgment, then your hand's going to get very hot in this situation. So it, it leads you to keep raising the light. And, and that's something. For the first nine weeks, you're always going to be playing with that light. Yeah, like, especially until they're feathered out. That's when you really have to watch the temperature because they can get too cold. And Yeah, and, and you can do it with thermometers and you can do all kinds. You read all the technical and that's fine if you do it that way. There's nothing wrong with that. But we raise five to six hundred baby chicks a year have for six years and we send all of our customers home with the same advice that we just gave you which is using your hand and just using common sense but the other piece to that is you got to remember that too much heat when we talked about earlier in the brooder if the brooder if the heat can't escape the brooder um, you're 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 making a microclimate for that baby chicken that is hotter than they can tolerate and that will lead to dehydration and you can have problems with you know they may die and yeah. you know not to scare you because you should everyone should still do this it's not that big of a deal um but yeah that's what we do and then we we set the light based on that hand test that i said and we check that probably not daily but maybe every other day certainly for the first two weeks we check it every other day well when we go down to check their water and food we usually can tell by that time if they're too hot, too cold, depending on how they're acting and where they are in their brooder. Yeah, because if uh, what we use as a good guide is that uh, if, and this is this doesn't apply if you're down standing in front playing with the chickens, but if, if you sneak up on them and they don't know you're there and they're all laid out and they're laid out all around the, you know, if, you're, if your light is shining, you know, right here and they're all laid around the perimeter of the light then that means that the light is too hot like if there's no one laying underneath the light then then it's too hot for them right underneath the light now if you go down and there's a whole big pile of them right directly underneath the light and they're all huddled up well that means they're cold um they're not getting enough heat from the light so i mean it i know that sounds pretty simple but it's something that a lot of people overlook so that's what we do. We set the light based on the hand test, and we do that every couple of days for the first three weeks probably. After that, we probably do it maybe twice a week. Um, and then we double check that by, like I said, just sneaking up on them and making sure that how they're laying underneath the light, how they're distributed, you know, is, is appropriate. If, if they're kind of evenly distributed all underneath the light and around, then your temperature is perfect. And what we kind of shoot for is to be a little bit to the pushing them out to the outside. Yeah. And our rationale on that is that at least if they're to the outside, then they know they can escape it and they're definitely getting enough heat. We do not want them piled up underneath because that's when they start suffocating each other. If they get too cold, they'll all lay in and then some will end up on the bottom of that pile and suffocate. Yeah. So. so the bedding that we use <coughs> is wood chips. Yeah, pine. Um, yeah, pine wood chips because that's what's available in our area. Yeah. Um, it works really well, easy cleanup. You just have to make sure that to clean out around the waters because like, 
points it up and they can't yeah. get at it. And, and, and they fill their food dishes with it too. Yeah, and a little trick for that is when they're uh, when they're the first four days, set those little waters and little feeders right on the right on the bedding. But after four days, set them on a board. Yeah. And then after a week and a half, set them on a two by four. And after a week and a half, put them on a four by four. And that way. You're always bringing the height of the water and the feeder up a little bit as the chick grows, and they can still reach it, but it's not as easy for them to scratch bedding and to poop in their water yeah. and their feeder. Or scratch and... their feed right out of it. Right. Yeah. Oh. And then, uh, it should go without saying, but keeping that clean. Clean and dry is yes. very, very important. Yeah. Um, so, first few days, they really won't uh, be... Um, pooping that much um but they will (laughs) um but not that bad but then after that we'll just scrape out kind of the top layer that has any of the poop in it and then put in new bedding and we usually end up putting in bedding every three days maybe or something for the first while and then as they get older um you'll be putting it in almost every day or at least top dressing it every day and then maybe taking a one big clean out a week or two clean outs a week um yeah and that's but again, common sense, keep them dry, keep them clean. Yeah. All right. So with their waters... I was going to say one more thing on oh, that, okay. though. Um, the one biggest condition that we've had to deal with, and we, we advise all of our customers that go home with baby chicks, is pasty butt. Oh, yeah. Okay, and that is something that uh, definitely affects chicks in the first probably 10 days. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe two weeks. And essentially all it means is that they'll have a runnier poop than they should that poop will stick in the feathers underneath their vent and it will basically harden up to the point that they're not able to poop anymore. Yeah, and they'll die. And they'll die. So for the first several days, we make a big point to go down and, and look we'll over every bombs. bird and we check them over. And if, if they do have pasty butt, then we, we dip them in a little bit of warm water and just kind of pick it till it's yeah, just free. Just when you peel it off, just careful not to peel it off and rip the skin because ripping the skin will lead to an infection because a chicken pen is a very dirty place no matter how clean you keep it. It will also lead to the other birds picking on it. Yeah. Okay? So, uh, but nice. but you have to watch for pasty butt. That can definitely be a problem. Yeah. So with pasty butt, they are, they're saying that it's um, due to dehydration. Yeah. And that's where this stuff comes in. So yeah. Say, oh. oh, sorry. Didn't mean to. <laughs> So all it is is um, electrolytes and vitamins, and it comes in a um, powdered form. That's a little bag here, it's kind of orange. And when we mix it up, we put like this amount in, it's about 20 grams, is that what it was? Yeah, I think it's about 20 grams. 20 okay. grams, and we put it in like a big orange juice container, wrap yeah. it so your children don't actually yeah, very important that you don't <laughs> let your kids be drinking this. Although I don't, I don't see anything on there that says it no. would hurt them, but I wouldn't want them drinking it. No. So that's why we mark stress aid and yeah. big X's. So that's really good for the first couple of weeks um, when they first are hatched and in their brooder. just helps with, um, like, there's so much going on. They've had so many changes, you know, come from the hatcher or wherever you bought them. And, you know, new foods, different birds that they're around and whatnot. And it just helps keeps everything balanced. It's just an electrolyte yeah. solution is all it is. So there is, again, a technical way. You can read the bag. You can apply yeah. it as per what they say, and it works out to something like an eighth of a teaspoon per liter of water. I don't even know what it is. We don't follow any of that. It's too much math for me. We mix it up until it's just a uh, looks like tang or orange juice kind of thing, and yeah. then we just use our eyeballs. So when we put it um, into the water, so that we change out one of those little half-liter waters, we just put a little glug of this in, yeah. just enough so it takes the water and makes it a very, very slight yeah. off yellow color. Yep, yeah, that's it. And, and, and that's all we do. We've been pretty fortunate so far. Yeah, and we keep this on hand because even for our adult birds, we keep this around yeah. for them if we end up running into a, any problem with adult yeah. birds as well. It's a great thing. We can talk about that later in another yeah. one too. Um, and yeah, so then after that, so that's basically all the pieces that we wanted to cover. Um, there's no problem. A lot of people ask us, like, oh, can one breed mix with the other? And can I have a one week old chick in with a two week old chick? And so, first off, breeds don't care. They are, there's no racism no. In, uh, in chickens. They don't care about uh, each other. They'll happily play along or pick on whoever. Yeah. Um, 
as far as um, combining you know different age classes we will we we do it probably to a span of four weeks sometimes I mean it, that's maybe not ideal and if I could have my way I would put you know all the closer age yeah, ones together. Yeah we do try and keep them closer but sometimes it just doesn't work that way and if you the little it, ones have to go in with the big ones and if you find that find it out in the playground like the other kids. <laughs> yeah if you find that buff Orpington that you always wanted and you had to get it two weeks after you got all your bard rocks and whatever that's stick okay. it in that's fine. Not a big deal. It's really not. No. Um, and then, um, yeah, and that's basically, that's basically it for raising yeah. baby chicks. So, uh, it's not that complicated. Don't overthink of it. Yeah. Don't overthink it. No Don't overthink it. A lot of people way overthink it. Yeah. So thank you very much for watching and, uh, please like and subscribe and, uh, follow us for some more details. You can check out any of the crazy stuff we're doing. Um, sometime this summer we're going to be doing, or this spring we're going to be doing, mushrooms growing in logs and we're going to be doing some uh, work on the with the sawmill my Norwood HD 36 hydraulic sawmill um, we're going to be working in the woods with our horse Chevy we've got um, we've got some baby pigs that we uh, have here now that they may make an appearance here sometime we have lambs we'll be butchering we have lots of stuff so uh, follow along to see all the craziness we get into and thanks for, for watching See you next time. See you next time.